Symbolic History Through Sight and Sound, 34, 1914, Crisis of the Abstract. If desire is a lack, post-traumatic desire is loaded. In Monet, in Foray, in Verlaine, wish is the sensuous inverse of fulfillment. How blue the sky was, and how great our hope. Qu'il était bleu le ciel, et grand l'espoir. This flowered headland cries to the wind, the wistful beatitudes of light and air. Such poignant Chausson would learn from Foray, though swayed already by the younger Debussy. The Chausson Concerto just paired with Monet equally swells toward the Wagnerian counterpole of symbolist Moreau, this 1896 Jupiter and Semele, of which the artist wrote, Semele, penetrated by the divine effluence, dies struck by lightning, and with her dies the genius of terrestrial love, the genius with the goat hooves. It is an ascension toward the upper spheres, death on earth, and apotheosis in immortality. How far from Renaissance this late revival of its tragic theme. Benvenuto Cellini, by his own account, as overcharged a revolutionary as any of the avant-garde, poured the bronze Perseus in 1553 under trial set forth in the autobiography. After a quarrel with the Duke of Florence, my lord, you do not understand my art. He fires the furnaces, the house roof takes the blaze, a sudden fever drives him to his bed. When rain and wind have caked the bronze, a slacker, twisted in the shape of an S, appears. You are attempting an enterprise which the laws of art do not sanction and which cannot succeed. Cellini resurrects, piles on oak, hurls all his pewter in the melt, opens the sluices to an explosion and flash of flame. No man, they say, could have brought it off, only some powerful devil, vulnerable as Faust. Yet the achieved Perseus is a victory of light, for which Cellini's elation was prayer. I fell on my knees, O oh God, who didst rise from the dead and ascend to heaven. Even the dissonant works of Renaissance, Mudaro's Falsas, Have a containment like Lear. The wheel has come full circle. I am here. tears containment in a life and death ecstasy, a rite of passage where the very record of loss, incapacity, negation, turns by paradox to a yea frenzy of the absolute. From Rambo's Bateau Ivre to the First World War, that transformation prevails. And even when trench stalemate had betrayed its dominant yes to the great recessive no, 
and the backlash of Dada was cracking the whip of the absurd. Even then, how soon, in Clay's 1916, stars over evil houses, or the programmatic despairs of Schoenberg or Berg, this tenebrous, presto, delirando, from the lyric suite, how soon, Spenglerian fall, the dance of the dream-led masses down the dark mountain phosphoresces, a self-affirming energy. That going under of the physical and spatial Blake's art had prophesied. The world will be consumed in fire, displaying the infinite which was hid. In this 1800 Bathsheba seen by David, the Beulah Garden is at once of the fall. Cruel sacrifices had brought humanity into a feminine tabernacle in the loins of Abraham and David. And of love's redemption, Bathsheba, Hittite adulteress, on the line to Mary. O oh, divine humanity, if I were pure, I should never have known thee. In his solitary precursing of avant-garde, Blake made the Bible his point of departure. By 1885, under the sway of Wagner, this Siegfried idol and of Nietzsche, when the Dionysian powers rise with such strength as we are experiencing at present, there can be no doubt that wrapped in a cloud, Apollo has already descended to us, whose fullest and most beautiful effects a coming generation may perhaps behold. Hans von Mares, in this pagan triptych, unconsciously tied to Blake's abstraction, sets the serpent-guarded Eden of renewal in the Hesperides. Nietzsche, blessed race of Hellenes, what must this people have suffered that they might become thus beautiful? What cleansing of the romantic stable is already implied in the Nietzschean and Blakean reversal of values, fire as delight, pain as power. With Cezanne, the disruption of the personal and formulable crystallizes past loss, the dynastasis of that overthrow. Perhaps Ives, in New England of all places, pursued a like purging, as in the first symphony, written while he was still a student at Yale. At the same time, Mallarmé's aesthetic of pure poetry broke off 1898 with the picture pages of a throw of dice, the poem constellated by the annihilation, le hasard, of its objects, collapsed by the indifferent neutrality of the abyss, neutralité identique du gouffre. In the abstract, stripping of romantic flesh, Manet's 1863 Olympia focused the art breakthrough and social outrage. This takeoff on Titian's Venus of Urbino, itself an adulteration of Giorgione's ideal, like Shakespeare's, if hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head short-circuited, normal responses, amorous, moral, even practical. As Courbet complained, flat, like the queen of spades coming out of a bath. If Baudelaire played such a role, it is with a lushness far from the queen of spades. In the coolest anger, 1814, where the tradition of the 19th century harim odalisque begins, the style of Fontainebleau already swells with seductive touch. From Baudelaire, the climactic poem would be the jewels, les bijoux, la très chère était nue, the most dear was naked, and knowing my heart had kept nothing but her sonorous jewelry, ces bijoux sonores. In Delacroix's 1827 Odalisque with a parrot, Bonington and Etty bring in memories of Keats. 
unclasps her warmed jewels one by one. The abandon of Byron's high day, passion's child, born where the sun showers triple light and scorches even the kiss of his gazelle-eyed daughters. Though this voluptuous dream has hardly entered the bordel of erotic ennui and decadence which had the jewels censored from the 1861 Fleur du Mal, she was recumbent and let herself be loved. Elle était donc couchée et se laissait aimer. Courbet's 1856 Girls Were the Same even more than his nudes, advances the passion throttle commensurately with Baudelaire. A certain candor, coupled with lasciviousness, gave a new charm to her metamorphoses. It is the coloration which runs in music from Berlioz through Bizet, this Saint-Saëns de Lila to a whole Scheherazade horizon. And in this Renoir 1870 odalisque, the languorous flesh of Courbet, more exotically clothed, has, at the risk of calm, almost been wallowed in. Whereas Baudelaire, even as ravished by Jean Duval's flashing world of metal and stone, where sound is mingled with light, où le son se mêle à la lumière. Even as he lifts to the adored, couched at the height of the divan, a passion deep and gentle as the sea, which mounts toward her, as toward its cliff, must draw release from that poison. Cézanne would take up the scene in his extraordinary mockery of Manet's Olympia, as if the grotesque were one rescue from the Scylla vortex. Since rescue was required, the new worship must rear on lubricity itself a paradox of equilibrium, what would drive Renoir from this lush indulgence toward nudes like Maillot's later bronzes of statuesque repose. But how? At the condemned erotic bound of Les Bijoux, her eyes fixed on me like a tame tiger, with a vague air of trance she varied her poses. How to refine the postures of a West Indian mulatto to a contemplative counterpart of the mystical. No artist plumbed that flower of evil maelstrom more recklessly than Van Gogh after his 1886 arrival in Impressionist Paris. Baudelaire, and her arms, her legs, her hips, and her loins, polished as smooth as oil, undulant as a swan, passed before my eyes, clairvoyant and serene, and her belly and her breasts, clusters of my vine, et son ventre et ses seins, ses grappes de ma vie. In that seizure where, as with Dante's damned, fear turns into desire, it is no longer the woman, flesh-throned on the divan, who looks down, but the poet from crystal rock, at the hips of Antiope, the torso of a boy, those postures which advance as to dislodge his spirit from the height, où calme et solitaire, elle s'était assise. If Van Gogh's calm was in question, Gauguin variously assumed the Baudelaire mystique of contemplative eros, as in this Tahitian Nevermore, another variation on Manet's Olympia, to suggest, he said, by means of a simple nude, a certain long-lost barbarian luxury. But for Baudelaire, a romantic half-century before, the self-transcendence of spleen asked a more excruciating stretch, as he wrote, into this atrocious book, I put all my heart, all my tenderness, all my religion, travestied, all my hatred. On her savage brown complexion, the rouge was superb. Sur ce teint fauve et brun, le phare d'été superbe. By a sensuous art of sex, to bewitch pure flame from the devouring cleft itself. <laughs> ¶¶ 
What Joyce would do with Molly Bloom's I will. What A.G. with the girl sleeping on the floor, as if flame were breathed forth from it. Though these, like Matisse's 1905 Gypsy, or Stravinsky's Firebird, lend the attack of this century to the arcane glow of Baudelaire's last stanza. And the lamp at last being resigned to die, it was the fire alone which lighted the room, which every time it uttered a sigh of flame, flooded with blood that amber-colored skin. Et la lampe s'étant résignée à mourir, comme le foyer seul illuminait la chambre, chaque fois qu'il poussait un flamboyant soupir, il inondait de sang cette peau couleur d'ombre. A tantric prolongatio of fire and blood. In the oil of verbal texture, Baudelaire might seem a romantic decadent, but in the ambiguity of crushed opposites, spleen become ideal. The harmonie du soir that so moved Joyce, where through an evening drowned in curdled blood, memory shines like a monstrance. Or the untranslatable luxe, calme et volupté, which Matisse mythologized in 1906 in Baudelaire's unmediated elation by negation. We have crashed the gates of the modern, Yeats. I must lie down where all the ladders start, in the foul rag and bone shop of the heart. Even the Faust of mechanical power was cloven. Priestley's technocratic hope already undercut in Franklin's 1780 letter. It is impossible to imagine the height to which may be carried in a thousand years the power of man over matter. Oh, that moral science were in his fair way of improvement. Whatever euphoria drove Brunel to engineering marvels, railroads, bridges, this 1857 iron ship, the Great Eastern, a wonder city to cut the night ocean in lighted luxury, broke in morbidity. The industrial call clotting round the soul like Baudelaire's evening, le néon vaste et noir, where the tender heart enshrines its luminous past. In the crystal palace of exposition Europe, ambivalent progress, brood ambivalent dream. The great four-leafed clover of modern idealism, as they were praised, Berkeley, Moreau, Puvis de Chaban, pre-Raphaelite Burne Jones of this golden stair. And might not the great Eastern or any of her more practical successors of the Jamesian era have adorned their steel salons with Botticelli-inspired visions of such secretly erotic beatitude, Rossetti's blessed damosel who leaned from the gold bar of heaven and laid her face between her hands and wept. I heard her tears. But when Monet, in 1877, frequenting the Gare Saint-Lazare in Paris, painted the same scene through variations of cloud and hour. The steam blue against background sunlight, or white against an overcast gray. He cut through those arguments of nostalgic heaven and industrial hell. Yet what is signified? Hardly Vermeer's irradiation of the actual, Traherne, your enjoyment of the world is never right till every morning you awake in heaven, look upon the skies, the earth and the air as celestial joys. Monet's naturalist delight is in the changes of abstract perception, a sea surface full of clouds. In the art detachment of any such station, Tolstoy's Anna Karenina, the novel finished that same year, might have gone under the wheels. A luggage train was coming in. The platform began to sway. She knew what she had to do. A feeling such as she had known when about to take the first plunge in bathing came upon her. What am I doing? What for? Since the Paris Exposition of 1889, the Eiffel Tower has expressed for tourists everywhere the joy of the Impressionist city, the excitement and utility of the sky race of skeletal steel. Though not even the designer claimed a utility beyond the view, that abstraction concretized, so barked, out of Hugo's hunchback or Michelet's tableau. 
but the great precursors are Christ attempted by the kingdoms of the world, or in Goethe's Faust, Lincius on the tower. Zum Sehen geboren, zum Schauen bestellt, dem Turme geschworen, gefällt mir die Welt. Born for seeing, at watching skilled, pledged to the tower, I delight in the world. Thus he sees the ship at sunset enter the harbour, and that night the burning of the house of the pious old couple. When scientific vision had girded the 984-foot tower over the Seine, aviation was anticipated, and the vibrant geometry of Cezanne strangely paralleled. The delight, however, is of Rimbaud's drunken boat, of Mallarmé's sail past fertile islands, but oh, my heart, hear the sailor's song, Entend le chant des matelots. No doubt, as in Foray, avant-garde was always tempted to a compromise of genial cultivation. No doubt Renoir was as gifted as any for the color-glad depiction of life as pleasantly lived. Perhaps that ease left him vulnerable to the form crisis and sterility of 1883, on the way to which even the lustiest group scenes, this boating party of mashers, top hats, flirts, puppy-kissing girls, and trained surface realism in a sort of Joycean search for radical value. So the plucked string scherzo of early foray reaches toward the remoter harmonies it drew from Debussy. Nor was it merely a dictate of Puritan morality that James, from the American 1877 to the Ambassadors 1903, should alienate the Impressionism he handled so well. As in late Monet, Cezanne, Seurat, there was an abstract imperative. Even Manet, oldest of them all, who had begun the revolution by a detached flattening of dark Spanish realism, who in the success of his forties had joined Monet in pure color and open air, arrived by 1882, a year before his death, at the mysterious and formal illusions of a bar at the Folie Bergère. Where everything beyond the foreground bottles and the musing girl is reflected in a mirror, her back, the looming customer, theater and lights, platonic images. Pissarro was at the center of Impressionism, originator with Monet of its theory and practice, but he is also the radiant for post-Impressionism to follow. From 1871 to 77, his teaching brought Cezanne to a threshold of light. One might think to see in this Pissarro landscape of red roofs how much Cezanne could have learned from him. But the painting from the last year of the Cezanne Association dramatizes the teacher as learner. Without what Pissarro taught, Cezanne's early violence could hardly have lightened to this house of Père Lacroix. Yet Cezanne painted the picture in 1873, four years before Pissarro's Red Roofs. In the interplay of that avant-garde, effect continually circles and acts as cause. Again Pissarro from eighteen eighty seven time of Satie's first radically neglected piano compositions. This from the Gymnopédie to be orchestrated by Debussy. Pissarro, teacher of everyone, might seem in this orchard to have gone as far as Impressionism could in preparing for neo-Impressionist Seurat with his consuming science of minute color spots. But here too, the influence goes the other way. The master swayed 
by a pupil's genius. Since more than five years earlier, Sora, studying with Pissarro, had begun those ravishing sketches in which color division works from observed nature toward a final harmony of abstract, luminist control. Scores of studies in charcoal and oil, exploring and fixing the intellectual geometry of the great pointillist monuments, where Impressionism becomes its own antithesis, Baudelaire's passion throned on crystal rock, Valérie, this tranquil roof where pigeons promenade trembles between the pines among the tombs. Noon, the just, composes there with fire the sea, the sea, forever re-begun. James, the ambassadors, in the garden of the Tuileries. He watched little brisk figures, figures whose movement was as the tick of the great Paris clock take their smooth diagonal from point to point. The Grand Jatt is as total a fulfillment of Seurat's method as any. What mappings of the scene, open-air studies and stage-set division of the players, remote from each other as the characters of a Chekhov play, produce this life-size frieze where all motion, all life is still not merely as every carved or painted object must be, but in doctrinal soul, proclaiming a metaphysics of changeless remove, as Valérie would invoke the sun at the zenith, midi le juste, a zeno paradox, to immobilize that cemetery by the sea, Zenon, cruel Zenon, Zenon délai, Zeno, cruel Zeno, Zeno of Elia, have you fixed me with that arrow winged that whirls and flies and cannot fly the place? O oh, son, what taught a shadow for the soul? Achilles, with his great stride, motionless. In a direction opposite to Seurat's, Van Gogh, too, ricochets from Pissarro.